He has completed his master's in science and engineering in 1998 from AMU Oliver. Now, he did his PhD from University of Lima, Ireland in 2004. He has a teaching and research experience of 22, more than 22 years. He has an expert, expertise in the field of ergonomics, industrial engineering. He has guided more than five doctoral students and more than 23 master's students. He has four patents also. He has been awarded for three best paper awards, one IE uh, Young Engineer Award and two scholarships. He has created multidisciplinary research facilities in the Center of Interdisciplinary Research in Biomedical and Human Factor Engineering, Human Machine Interaction, Human Vibration Responses and EMG. Now with these words, we would request Professor Abid Ali Khan to kindly take the session so that we all can benefit from this lecture. Please, sir. Thank you very much, Pooja. Uh, first of all, thanks uh, Delhi Technological University to give me this opportunity to interact with uh, faculty members from different colleges as well as from DPU. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Professor Pasim Murtaza, Dr. Pushpendra, Professor S.K. Gurg, and all those who were the organizing team of this Atal FTP program. Uh, it is always a good uh, time to share the experiences or share the knowledge which we are also learning as being a student in this profession with the, our peers and our colleagues. Today's topic which uh, I have chosen or I was given uh, with the consent of the organizers was human fatigue analysis in modern industry. Most of the time being mechanical engineer we are talking about machines, their operations, their productivity, all those things where we want output and best output. As we all know that there are two ends of leadership. One is production oriented and another is uh, human oriented. And one end is more concerned about human, uh, their fatigue, their comfort, their, their productivity, their um, um, discomfort and the other is which is more concerned about output efficiency effectiveness productivity and all those things it is uh, not a easy job to keep a balance but although we have to keep a balance because if we don't keep a balance we are losing a skill we are losing a human we are losing their ability we are losing their capability we are losing their their efficiency also so when we talk about efficiency, then the, the hardcore manager who are production oriented, they this lightly uh, get a pause and try to think about, yes, we should be concerned over human. Starting from the, the, the studies of Bell industry and Hawthorne experiments, uh, then uh, other um, uh, experiments of F.W. Taylor, Gilbreth, these uh, the concept of industrial engineering has uh, emerged and they were taking concern of the production with respect to the human performance and when the human performance is affected the productivity is affected that is why we are more concerned about human fatigue if i share before starting the lecture before starting the topic you might be bored or something i want to share some some of the videos which i have collected and then uh, we will talk about why the product, why the human fatigue analysis is important in modern industry. Modern industry could be anything. It is our agriculture industry. It is our uh, uh, day to day life. It may be a factory work. See this example of uh, open. Almost every one of us has an experience of looking at this grass cutting operation. When you see the risk involved, when you see the, the cost human is paying from his body, his physiology, it is not a simple thing. When we are sitting in our office and talking about uh, only uh, the productivity, we cannot think about the, the effort and the, the expenditure the body is paying to get the work done. See another example.
I'm taking the examples of day-to-day -day life more than the production of the materials. You see, buns are being uh, made in a, in a bakery. The cost human is paying is not in a small cost. The only thing is that we are concerned or not. That matters. Whether we are concerned about human body or not. But the cost he is paying being exposed to so much heat, so much frequency of work, so much load, that is that is not, not an easy thing. The body is under stress and strain. We can see the work of construction. Anyway, these were some of the examples I will share once they will be downloaded. See here, the construction work going on in, in a building and the workers are exposed to hot weather, workers are exposed to heavy load, workers are exposed to a repetitive work. And see, the task they are doing is not a simple task. Uh, even we cannot understand, we cannot have a feel of the pain, what they are taking to build up a home the pain, what the cost they are paying is quite high, but we could not understand because we are only thinking about the bags of the cements. We are thinking about the wall is lifted. We are thinking about the linter is placed, but the cost is being paid is quite significant. The cost is being paid is a, is a cost of life. Cost is being paid is a cost of efficiency. Cost is being paid of the cost of a skill because if we talk about the glass industry, the worker become inefficient after five to 10 years. So it means the very heavily required skill is being lost. This is hardware industry. You see in Adigar, the worker is sitting on shop floor and doing the task. So what do we understand from all this is there is a relationship of stress and strain. Stress is what the, is the stimuli. What is the work? What is the task? What is the load? What is the environment in which the worker or the person is operating? The strain is what the body is feeling about. What the how the body is taking up that load? A rickshaw puller who is who is pulling a rickshaw. He he requires a quite heavy oxygen in, inhaling and exhaling capability as well as quite good knees so that he can work on a repetitive cycling rate to pull the rickshaws. Quite good blood flow, quite good sufficient amount of uh, carbohydrates to, to maintain his energy. So these are, this is a relationship of a stress and a strain. But the task may be of two types. Task may be static, task may be, uh, may be dynamic. When we talk about a static task, suppose I ask you to hold a load of five kg in hand and be standing in a position it will stress a lot in a in a short while but if we are talking about the the dynamic work you can do it for more longer period than the static work from the same load the reason is that in dynamic work it is accumulation of stress and release of the stress the reason is that in dynamic work you have more oxygen to decompose the lactic acid accumulated in the body that is the main cause of fatigue the muscular fatigue because we don't have more energy packets energy packets or glucose is not being decomposed into carbon dioxide and water there are a lot of reactions in between this decomposition of glucose i'm not going in those details of the development of uh, atp adenosine triphosphate or adp is adenosine triphosphate we are not going in that detail but we can understand to a basic level that if the sufficient oxygen is available and we are exercising, 
in that case uh, in that case the the thing is we have oxygen that can play a role in decomposing the lactic acid of, uh, and to into carbon dioxide and water so that we are uh, we are relieved our fatigue is uh, is released and that way we can do the work again so in a static the fatigue is accumulated at a very faster uh, rate as compared to the dynamic work but there are many methods to to evaluate these type of stresses in the industry and so that we can take the corrective actions there are direct and indirect methods available um, which uh, we can take advantage of but before that if i say static work we are talking about then in a static work there is sustained muscle contraction sorry there is sustained muscle contraction but in dynamic work we have repetitive muscle contraction and relaxation cycle that is what i explained in dynamic work most of the blood flow is towards the muscles it is increased uh, this that is why most of the dynamic work is based on what is called as aerobic exercises most of the static work is sometimes referred to in aerobic exercises to increase in muscle oxygen consumption no increase in static work but in dynamic work static increase is there in oxygen independent energy production which is very hard for the body cells to produce but there is oxygen dependent energy production that is easy to produce in this case and so this is just a comparison of uh, dynamic and static load as we had seen that the person is holding a uh, cement on on the head and just transporting from one place to other place but the person who is cutting the grass is doing a kind of dynamic work although he is getting a strain on tendons and uh, ligaments which are joining the bones of the body there may be pain pain is generally in brain what we feel about fatigue is in muscles so that kind of uh, relationship exists between both the things the only thing is we have to control the the injuries which are going to develop permanently with the body so that if the it is uh, no question that no human being can can live without having an exposure to fatigue however we have to see that it should not convert into the permanent injury that is why we try to uh, implement certain uh, rules regulations guidelines we take the advantage of uh, the guidelines issued by national institute of occupational safety and health or occupational safety and health administration some isos and isi ministry of uh, labor has a particular center in bombay that issues the guidelines for human um, performance or human human capabilities limitations now moving further there are certain methods which i will talk today um, those may be helpful in evaluating and assessing the task and its uh, level of risk involved in developing the the basic uh, common occupational injury what we call must work related musculoskeletal disorder these are generally referred as um, generally referred as wmsds or repetitive strain injuries or repetitive motion injuries or uh, cumulative trauma disorders these are all all synonyms to each other work related musculoskeletal disorder repetitive strain injuries repetitive motion injuries cumulative trauma disorder there are many kinds of uh, uh, appearances for example tendinitis for example tennis elbow carpal tunnel syndrome which is nothing but the compression of the nerves in the wrist so that the blood supply to the fingers is not proper this injury happens to heavy load typists um, earlier it was more but nowadays the the, the keyboards are have designs have been optimized towards the ergonomic design so these things have been controlled and modified 
in the way that the person may be less strained and can work for more hours or give the more productivity in the hours devoted to the working conditions. So these are some of them. But uh, when these uh, uh, these injuries have certain uh, what we call factors on which this depends. So if we make a make a factor diagram, cause and effect diagram, then these are WMSDs which are affected by bad posture, more frequency, more frequency of work heavy load, heavy force or exertion, exertion, uh, weather or temperature. It may be hot, it may be cold. There may be uh, stress is also possible from the, the illumination. Glare, for example, you are working on the computer screen and the screen is towards the window and you are getting a glare on the screen, you, you, you may not be comfortable to work on it. You would be fatigued easily. If your computer screen is more straining, your eyesight may be affected. Your contrast capability will be affected or contrast ability will be affected. So these are cause, this is what we call fishbone diagram and cause and effect diagram, whatever you call it. It helps us in general to assess the relationship of the factors over the, over the, uh, the, the fatigues. So this is uh, based on all these relationships, many researchers for the last 50 years, I could say, or 60 years, they are working hard to develop the methodologies, which may be easy to use in the industry. There are both types of techniques for assessing the fatigue. For example, you take the blood sample and you, you find out the percentage of lactic acid. It may not be a simple job to know the fatigue in the industry. So, they should have a kind of uh, easy methods which will give you a quick assessment of the work, work or task. And that easy method cannot be simply a paper pen method, but these paper pen methods, even though these are available, we can have a kind of um, background correlation between physiological parameters and these methods. If we see here, in two categories, we do divide this work assessment techniques. One is called as, sorry, one is called as subjective measurement of physiological strain and the other is called as objective measurement of physiological strain. When we talk about objective measurement of physiological strain, respiratory response, which is nothing but PO2, voluntary oxygen, intake and exhaling capability. The, for, as, as we had taken the example of rickshaw puller, the oxygen inhaling and exhaling capacity required for a particular task may be uh, in terms of percentage with respect to the maximum lungs capability and resting requirement. So there may be resting requirement of 0.5 liters per minute or there may be heavy load requirement of 25 or 5 liters per minute. So that relationship between uh, the maximum and minimum requirement of the lungs for, of the oxygen by the body can be a response for for assessing the capability of human to work do the work for a continuous period of time and that parameter also helps us in assessing the rest periods required or the the endurance period required which is nothing but the time for which a person can sustain the same work. There, there is a good um, output or good assessment using what is called as cardiac response. Cardiac response may be heart rate. As you are exposed to heat, as you are exposed to work, as you are exposed to sports, your heart rate goes up. But there is a there is a normal heart rate in the rest period, but when it goes up, it goes to a particular level. And then if you stop working, this is a working period, stop working, this will be a recovery period, your heart rate goes down in the recovery period. So that way, you, you are basically finding out a, a, a correlation, which may not be a linear in all the cases, 
between the load or the work with respect to the heart rate. And the same happened with, to some extent with BP, ACG, blood flow. Blood flow is a good parameter compared to uh, BP or ECG because blood flow gives us an idea whether the blood is towards the shell of the body or towards the core of the body. So in case of rest, blood flow is towards the core part of the body and it is uh, used in digestion, hearts, it's um, pumping to other core parts of the body. But when you are working, your muscles, skin and outer shell require more blood flow. So that is a parameter which can be an, an objective measurement of the relationship of the work and the workload on the human body. Then we have uh, some biosignals. Uh, biosignals. Biosignals are nothing but the signals we are getting in the form of electric signals from human body. This may be if taken from the muscle, it is called as EMG. If it is taken from the brain or skull, skull, it is called as EEG, which is electroencephalogram, electromyography. If it is taken from a skin, it is called as galvanic skin response. So there are, if it is taken from heart, it is called as electrocardiograms. So there are many uh, direct measurement, but direct measurement, using direct measurement in the industry is not an easy job. You require equipment, you require heavy sophisticated equipment and placing the sophisticated equipment in the rough workplace may, be, uh, may not be an easy job. So we try to develop or, or not be, the researchers have developed over a, over a longer period of time for last 50 years and they have developed a kind of correlation between objective methods and the subjective methods. Subjective methods are quick assessment techniques, which gives us an idea that how much risk is there in relation to WNSD. In relation to WMSD, work-related musculoskeletal disorder. So this gives us an idea about these techniques. Um, let's go further. There are certain uh, subjective methods. Very basic method may be looking at just a peanut to in the areas, but it is very effective method. It is just like a stress concentration diagram of the quality control. When we talk about quality control, for example, we take in a production of iron and iron plate, if get eroded or does not uh, pass through the guarantee period or does not pass through a proper uh, operating life, which is expected from the iron, we get a spots and corrosion on the plates. So what we do is we take the feedback over the iron plate and we ask the consumers, we ask the buyers, where do you get a the problem. If someone says here, someone says here, someone says here, someone says here. So what, what happens in this case, in this case, we get the point of concentration of the problem. This is concentration diagram of quality control. If we see in relation to this quality control technique, uh, our Bokes, uh, Collet and Bishop body discomfort map. This is nothing but dividing the body into certain regions. When we divide in the body into certain regions, we have highlighted the points here. One, two, three, or like this, the regions are divided. You, you can ask the workers at the end of the working time, or working duration, or working day, or assessment period. You can fix up a five minutes time giving for a work. Then the worker can identify where does he get a pain, get pain. So the point of pain will be identified, for example, neck. Someone says shoulder, the other says back. You can have front and back also. The other says neck, 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 neck. Someone says shoulder. So what you will get, 
from out of this, the assessment is that the discomfort zones are neck, shoulder, and lower back. So by this idea, by this way, we can find out the point of problem. And if we know the point of problem, we can make a necessary correction. If suppose you go and assess an office and you find a problem in the shoulder, what we can have an idea. We have to look uh, microscopically to the work uh, workplace. And then when we see the workplace, sometimes if take computer workstation, you may go to a bank, you may go to um, an, any, any other office where there are cubicles all around and the persons are working on computers. You will notice that the persons are having mouse very far away from their body. They are not having um, a tray. They may be having a tray for the keyboard, but they 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 may not having the tray for the for the mouse over there or the space within the tray for the mouse. So mouse is quite far away, and our hand remains abducted for longer periods. When hand remains abducted for longer periods, there is a static strain on the on the shoulder. So you can assess the the workstation and you can give an idea where the problem exists and that point of problem will be picked up and if the point of problem is known if, if the reason of the problem is known then half of the solution is obtained so that way and the rest of the job is of all what we call of the mechanical engineers so this way we can reach to the point where the solution may be available See another problem, uh, another uh, method, subjective methods here that is called as Bogues rating. It is very old method. In 1960s, he tried to develop a correlation between um, heartbeat and the, the rating. So that rating was modified over the time, but this relationship between heart rate from 60 to 200 was correlated to 60 to 20. But later on, this, this technique was simplified and modified to a very standard technique. This is a very standard procedure. Standard procedure and quick, quick uh, way of evaluating the, the exertion in the task. For example, the person is cutting paper, the exertion is low. The worker is cutting GI sheet, the exertion is quite high. So that way you can know what is the level of exertion in, in this. So if the person identifies six, it may be a quite a strong exertion level. So you can have an idea, you can design an experiment with different types of tasks, you can ask the different persons to do the task. You can take their perceptions and based on the perceptions, you can perform statistics and come out with the optimized solution. So that way we can use these two scales for the assessment of exertion as well as the point of discomfort. I'm just, just going through the, the subjective methods. Uh, then we will, we will discuss about biosignals or by uh, objective methods also in the in the second half part of this lecture. So moving further, I introduce one of the scale I'm using in most of my studies as well. And this is called as visual analog scale. This is basically a 100 mm or 10 centimeter scale, which is made either on paper or computer screen, computer screen within the program or without the program. You can have a programming behind it. You can design it in any, any of the virtual instrument software like LabVIEW or SciView. Um, and then you can uh, ask the person to scroll it so that he can give a, a, a level of discomfort felt by the worker in a specific task. That but before before taking the perception of the worker we must 
counsel them what do you mean by no discomfort, moderate discomfort, extreme discomfort. Generally, we give a trial of uh, what is called as endurance test. Endurance is nothing but the capability of the person to hold particular level of force for it for it ex till the extreme level of discomfort till the person is not capable to do it anymore. So in this case, we counsel them and we say that when you are fresh, you are relaxed, you had taken rest, and you are coming to the job without any pain or discomfort, it is a point of no discomfort. I suppose I ask you to hold a 5 kg load in hand. Hold it as long as possible. You will say after a while that I'm feeling pain, I'm not getting tired. And after some more duration, you will say that, oh, I will not hold it. May either reduce it or I, I'm going to leave it. Or that that is the point of extreme discomfort. So you are basically seeing a response of the discomfort, which is something like this. This is this is a kind of uh, discomfort where we find out what is called as endurance time. So this is this way the discomfort goes up. This is discomfort and this is holding time. This is a Lombard's formula which gives us an idea to calculate the endurance time with respect to with respect to the percentage of maximum voluntary contraction or maximum voluntary capability for example the person can apply a maximum grip force of 700 newtons so endurance time is is suppose the person is allowed uh, is asked to do a work at 400 newtons then what will be the endurance time? So 400 is nothing but 4 by 7 ratio of the, of the maximum capability. With respect to that, using the Romberts formula, we can find out the endurance time. But all these are correlations based on the experimental studies done by previous researchers. And still these techniques are very well accepted, very well used in the industry because they are quick to use. Another organized method uh, is called as rapid upper limb assessment. Generally, this method is used when there is a static work. As we go back to our pictures and we see the work, the person is doing a task here. See here, a person is doing a polishing work. You can see this is a hardware, the, the outer body of the mortise lock being uh, polished here. The person is sitting in a very odd posture. You see the curvature of the back, which is chaotic. It's not lumbar lordosis, which is recommended. But anyway, there is no option. You see the angle of the back and the the um, uh, thigh, then you see the angle at the knee, uh, then at the ankle, you see the whole posture, you see the wrist deviation, all these points are the stress points there. You see these are the stress points. When you see the stress points, either you should have a complete feedback from the worker, complete assessment of the workers, or you can go for some quick techniques. What are the quick techniques? As I had discussed, one of them is called as ruler, rapid upper limb assessment. This is mostly done for a static task. In this technique, body is Body is considered into different postural deviations. One part is 
arm and wrist. The other part is neck, trunk and leg. In this case, if the person is having arm in the working uh, in such an angle, this angle, then they give a, they want us to have a score of stress as plus two. If the person is working in this situation, which I told as a case in somewhere welding or overhead drilling or overhead screwing work, so in that case, the person is working in these zones where you have to give a stress score of plus four with respect to the upper arm position. And that score will come over in this region. Same thing happens when you consider the lower arm or the forearm of the body. Then in that case, you can give the score accordingly. Then you can give the score according to the wrist posture. Then you can add the whether the wrist is twisted either this way or supine or prone, because in this cases both the bones are crossing each other, adding to the stress. So we will have a score up here. Looking through the three scores goes to this table, and we pick up a particular point that goes up here. We add whether there is a muscle load, force, frequency, etc., and we get a final score of the wrist arm over here, for example, four. The same thing for the neck. If your neck is flexed forward or extended upward, that that may be the case in, uh, I could have some videos for uh, which, if I find time, I will share. Uh, in, uh, in drilling wells, oil wells, the person has to see the, the rig over, overhead. The person has to weld uh, in, in the trusses or in making bridges. So in those cases, the neck is in an extended position, not in the flex position forward. So in that case, you see the level of the score goes as four. And this is with respect to the trunk. You can have some score with respect to the leg. You can have some score based on all three score. You can go to the table two and you can find out a specific score from here. That score is added up with the force level and we get a final score up here. Based on these two scores, we go to a final table and find out the score of the wrist, arm, and, wrist, uh, and neck, leg, and this. These make a particular point and we find out a specific score. That is our final score. Gives us an idea about static working position, whether it is in the level of risk or it is not in the level of risk. As we see over here, as we see here, that if this final score goes in the range of one or two, the posture or the workplace is accepted. If it is from three to four, further investigation directions are required. If it is more than five or six, that means that you have to immediately implement the changes. Otherwise, the person is going to have a permanent injury or discomfort. So that is very, very uh, well accepted in the industry, very much required in the industry. I, even uh, I had trained some of the industries in uh, in Gurgaon about using uh, this using this techniques on the shop floor. Because if you use these techniques on the shop floor, you will quickly assess the level of risk involved, whether it is going to be in a permanent loss or going to be in a short term discomfort. Then we have another technique, which is for, for what we call repetitive work. There may be two kinds of activities by the worker at shop floor. One is static, mostly static. It may not be purely static. But some of the activities may be very repetitive in nature. For example, packaging on a production line. For example, screwing the the um, the cap on the bottle on the assembly line. For example, screwing the uh, screws in a in a making a fire alarm on the assembly line. The person is doing the task at a very repetitive rate. Posture is mostly comfortable, is uh, sitting on a very good. Uh, uh, you can say. Uh, table, chair, etc. But but the person is doing the task at a very high frequency. Maybe loading and unloading 
the things. For example, the person is loading the, the crates. For example, the person is handling some, some uh, package. So in that case, there are certain factors which were identified by Gurg. Gurg was a very renowned, uh, Arun Gurg was a very renowned ergonomist. Uh, Arun Gurg, who developed this technique. Uh, and this um, technique is uh, recommended by National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, USA. And this technique is for assessing the risk in repetitive tasks. But there are six factors which you have to identify the level of the factors involved in the task. Intensity of exertion, it means that whether you are cutting a paper or you are cutting a sheet, the intensity will be changed. Duration of exertion, how long you have to go on the strip, how long your force is engaged, effort per minute. This is a cycle frequency, which is effort per minute. Hand wrist posture, whether the wrist is more deviated or wrist is less deviated. If, if we are having a posture of hand shaking, that is almost considered as a neutral wrist posture. But when it is deviated more, either in ulnar direction or in radial direction or in extension direction or flexion direction or prone or supine, there, there may be six degrees of freedom over here. So in those cases, the risk may go, risk may go into a bad posture or upward posture. So the level can be identified. The speed of work, whether the work is quick or whether the work is slow. Duration of task per day, over the eight hours job, assuming the eight hours job, how much duration we are working and how much duration we are taking best. When we identify the categories of these six factors, then the correlated multipliers are given by curve. And those multipliers, these are the levels, five levels we can identify for intensity, duration, effort, posture, work, duration. When we identify the levels here, According to the levels, we can go for picking up the multiplier. For example, intensity was low. Intensity was low. Duration was quite high, so it can be 1.5. Efforts per minute was low. Risk posture was bad. Speed of work was slow. Duration of work per day was more. So in this case, the strain index is nothing but Multiplication of all these multipliers, 1 into 1.5 into 1 into 3 into 1 into 1. So whatever score you get, that gives us an idea about what is called as strain index. If it is less than 5, considered as safe. If it is more than 5, then you have to make changes. And changes must be according to the category of the multiplier where the changes is required. If frequency is more and contributing more towards stress, you have to control the frequency. Otherwise, you have to control the posture or the anything else. Sorry. So now um, we will talk a little more about um, manual material handling, which is a very common problem these days because lower back pain in second main important reason for disability after Alzheimer. If you see the studies all around the globe, <laughs> you will find that lower back pain is in one of the prominent reason for disability and lower back pain starts from very small mistakes. For example, if your mobile or keys are dropped on the floor, we would suggest don't bend your back, bend your knees. So bending back is more risk than bending knees. And when in the industry, you are lifting something at a very high frequency and bending the back at a very, very, uh, uh, frequently, then 
it is going to create a problem in L5S1. So that region of the spine get affected. A spine bones get herniated and that creates a pressure on the spinal cord. When it creates a pressure on the spinal cord, the spinal cord sends a signal processing of the of the what uh, is known as central nervous system is affected. When it is affected, we get a spike, uh, sprains, pains, uh, very, very high intensity pains in, in any of the limbs of the body. So that is what uh, we have to avoid. But to avoid, we should have a proper understanding of the, of the situation. The task may be lifting, lowering, pulling, carrying weights, frequency, and there may be eccentricity with respect to the gravity. Now see here, sometimes some is, uh, researchers have provided a guidelines like this, lift at 25 kg load more than 15 times per day, increases the risk of low back pain. Megaro found that low back symptoms were more common in workers who regularly lift weight of 3 kg or more in those sometimes lifted such a weight. Intensity of low back symptoms were even more common in those who rarely lift weight. So sometimes lifting creates a muscle strain. So it, it is at a lower list, but sometimes creating a, uh, doing a, un, uh, common task of lifting creates a problem. So there are many guidelines we will, we will come up over there. So, so the lower back pain is the main cause of disability, which is mainly an outcome of manual material hand. The spine, you get a problem mostly in this region for lower back pain. That is why it is recommended to have a lumbar lord assist posture of the spine instead of the kyphotic posture of the spine. So these just get herniated and creates a pressure on the spinal cord. And if the pressure is on the spinal cords, it's disturbed the whole central nervous system. Now, uh, back injuries, lifting and carry. Muscle and ligaments of the back can fail under excessive tension. Disc may be herniated, abdominal cavity owing to excessive intra-abdominal pressure. Sometimes people do use uh, uh, belts, but belts should be used when it is advisable. Otherwise, it is going to create unnecessary abdominal pressure. Prevention of manual material handling the most common is to train workers to live safely. Keep the load close to the body so that the gravity or center of gravity may not be disturbed. Keep a lift with bending knees, then bending back. Certain trainings may, may create a performance, may create an understanding, awareness, which brings workers on lesser risk. So... So this is one way. There are tentative one time. Maintaining number, number lordosis. Use hip joint to flex the trunk. Do not lift immediately after prolonged friction. Allow time for the disc nucleus to equilate. Avoid lifting shortly after rising from bed. Follow the pre-stress system. Do the posture that minimizes the load movement on the lumbar spine. Close to the load. Avoid twisting while lifting. Exploit the acceleration profile of the load. For example, you have to unload a, a, a self-paced assembly line. You, have, you are picking up the packet and placing on the, on the pallet. So take the advantage of the gravity instead of doing it against the gravity. So that way we can take the momentum or acceleration so that you can have lesser load on the body. There are many job risks. Every day we see the supplier of water coolers and supplier of the, the gas cylinders. 
if you watch the posture of the person supplying gas cylinders or the water coolers or water uh, water bottles onto every shop every day you can see the number of workers involved all around our country and the number of workers affected and disabled due to lower back pain the quantum is quite high i don't have exact statistics but i can say that this is the job affecting the person too much and making them disabled in a very short period of time but because they are not aware about it they are not trained uh, in doing the things properly they are not well equipped to do it on a lighter load it the problem is uh, increasing day by day and the number of workers involved in this industry is too high we can see that you can feel all around your own uh, day to day living there are many factors which can affect the performance of lifting gender anthropometry uh, weight uh, body mass index techniques etc there is one technique which is called as niosh lifting index it gives us an idea that what should be the level of load for a particular type of lifting you are lifting from one origin to a one destination there may be origin there may be destination where you are lifting the load at a particular frequency so if you do this there is a technique available which is based on three basic approaches biomechanical so assuming the whole body as a mechanism physiological the capability of the human body psychophysical the perception and perceived pain and discomfort of the human so these three approaches are come club together to find out a quick technique that is known as niosh lifting equation through lifting equation we find out a recommended weight limit as well as lifting index so these two things we take out from this techniques uh, by having a multipliers of uh, load constant horizontal distance multiplier vertical distance multiplier distance moved of the for the load asymmetry that is nothing but the twist in the body frequency multiplier at what frequency the worker is doing then the coupling lifting the load whether the proper coupling is there or not if we remember the old days packaging there was no cutouts in the cardboard boxes so person had to lift a bigger boxes either two persons are lifting or one person is lifting hand affected or so long but now the the boxes of tv fridge and all those things have some cutouts so that you can lift it easily so that way the coupling quality is changed okay so this is one technique lifting index is nothing but the load actual load divided by recommended weight limit so if it goes more than one it means the job is at risk so these are this is the graphical representation of the parameters how do you pick up from this for this technique asymmetry there are uh, i think these were all about or maximum uh, common techniques used for the fatigue assessment or work measurement subjectively had been discussed have been discussed now now moving further to what is called as direct measurement objective measurement which is mostly the the research topics but not the direct application it is mostly used in research because using biosignals we can get microscopic uh, analysis of the of the strain in the body so strain of the body can be microscopically or directly analyzed using the biosignal biosignal can be electrocardiogram biosignal may be uh, um, your electromyogram it, it may be electroencephalogram so these are three common biosignals although there are many other biosignals also um, so we this is respiratory response i just gave you idea that when you are at rest 
your oxygen intake is very low. When you are working, your oxygen intake increases. But when you start at rest, still you take long breaths because that is the deficit over here, which is compensated over here in the recovery. So that is a profile of aerobic power or aerobic pattern uh, what a particular human being can have. So this is directly in this uh, O2 intake is, is directly proportional to heart rate. It is directly proportional to, uh, to energy consumption. So these are these are three parameters which are directly proportional to each other. So we can take one any of them, and there are some expirometer or respirometry is available, which can give you the the exact amount of oxygen inhale and exhale by the person. You can put the mask over there, you can connect it with the oxygen cylinder and then you can have the respirometry or test. Cardiac response, we know that I had already discussed the distribution of the blood is more towards muscles when there is a heavy work. It is less when there is a rest. If you see the muscle and his skin, the profile is reversed as the digestive system and heart, kidneys, etc. So this is maximum aerobic power. Is different for for different genders. It is different for different age, and that's why we are advised to do yoga. We are advised to do breathing exercises so that we can increase our aerobic power. So. Yoga is also good for increasing the aerobic power because we uh, we try to uh, cure the construction of the lungs. We try to cure the the, the oxygen capability of the lungs, etc. Now, this is very important signal in argonauts, uh, which is called as electromyography. This is nothing but muscle response. Sir, you are not audible, sir. Please unmute your mic, sir. Okay. Was it for very long? Oh, so, so this is our EMG signal where we are considering the, the, the muscle activation. When muscles are compressed and expanded, we get an electrical activity here because of the recruitment of the motor neurons, which are excited due to the connection with the central nervous system and information and the load on the muscle. So that signal is in the form of uh, 
that is in the form of uh, what is called as uh, uh, millivolts or microvolts, which is amplified to the uh, preamplifiers attached to the muscles. And those signals have, uh, this is motor units, which are giving the, the command and the muscles are excited. And then we catch the signals. Uh, this is all happened because of the action potential of the body. Movement of the sodium, potassium, and chloride ions in the uh, in the axioms. When we get this signal, the signal is being conditioned, and the information is understand. The signal is of the form of a kind of random vibration. But when we when we rectify the signal and we get the RMS value, it is directly proportional to um, the the load on the muscle. I I give you an idea. This is a signal rectified signal. Initially, the signal was when you get from the muscle is in this form. This is rest. This is load on the muscle. When you rectify, you get this signal. But when you take the RMS value, you get this signal. This is a rectified signal. This is an RMS signal. This is in direct proportion to the muscle load. If the force is more, the signal's amplitude will be high. If the force is more, the amplitude is high. When, when there is a fatigue, then amplitude will be high because muscle will want to contribute more towards the more load. But the frequency of excitation of the motor neuron goes down as the fatigue developed in the signal. So that is an important phenomena which we should understand. That from one signal, what we can get an idea. So this is transformation from this is transformation from time domain signal to frequency domain signal. When the muscle is contributing more, the signal gets thicker, amplitude goes high. When the muscle is getting fatigued, then this power spectrum of the signal shifts towards lower side. So the frequency go of the signal goes down. That is a prime indication of the fatigue, which we will see in the next slide. See this here. This uh, reduction of the the frequency of the signal is an indicator of development of the fatigue in the muscle. Now, these two parameters, we um, there are many features in a statistics or biostatistics which you can apply to understand the properties and uh, and phenomena of the signal, behavior of the signal. Although these two parameters are very important here, one is RMS amplitude, that is a direct proportion of the effort. And the other is the change in the median frequency of the signal when we convert the signal into the frequency domain signal. So now these two parameters we can exploit to use for understanding the working conditions. I'll take you to, to a study where we tried to redesign the handle of the chainsaw. And when we uh, redesign the handle of the chainsaw, this operation of wood cutting required the expo uh, uh, work creating an exposure of vibration, load, awkward posture. All these parameters were over there. The wrist was bent, elbow um, was uh, having a particular angle, and the stress of uh, vibration. So when we redesigned this handle, what we compared the existing um, tool with the modified tool, then this was the modification in there. What we did, we captured the EMG signal from here. So this EMG signal in the existing uh, tool and in the modified tools were compared and we tried to find out whether for the same given task, whether the signal was improved or not. Now, <coughs> you see, application of a wood routing task where the person is doing either bidding work which is just creating a corner on the wood or creating a design in the wood 
so in that case this wood router is exposing a very heavy uh, awkward wrist posture as well as exposure of vibration from hands to chits so and see the posture over here this is quite quite uh, stressing to the worker and that's why we require the assessment and when we require the assessment of such type of task we do require the the application of biosignals like emg ecg etc so that we can understand how body is feeling perception is definitely high but we can also know that what the level of fatigue in the muscles are so in that cases we did, uh, did the comparison based on the feedback from the worker based on the vibration level measurements based on the posture measurement based on the uh, emg measurement which is nothing but the electrical activity got from the muscles as a signal based on the noise over there so these were the parameters based on that we assess this task and we perform the study so some studies were selected in this uh, some muscles were selected for the study and these muscles signal were captured and the further things were done accordingly now I'll take you uh, to three studies over here this is in one chart the same study is in one chart what we did was got the perception using the visual analog scale as well as the correlated bishop body discomfort map second was using the accelerometer we obtained the vibration level exposure to the hand using iso 5349 standards of measurement of hand arm vibration third one was electromyography the electrical activity of the muscles were recorded so these were three measurement instruments which were used in this study task was either bidding or dadu task which was a creating corner based on this the redesign of the router handles were made some interventions were done at different angles task was analyzed and based on emg parameter based on discomfort based on the experience of the worker and vibration level the the modified optimum design was proposed in this study another application of emg was in prosthetics and uh, rehabilitation so in this case sit to stand task is a very difficult nowadays for old age people especially more than 65 years of age they get knee problem developed over the time but uh, we try to find out the the understanding of the signals of uh, upper leg and lower leg muscles calf muscles <coughs> and um, uh, other muscles of the legs which gives a uh, bicep femoris or vestus lateralis muscles were considered in this uh, study applying this uh, the signal processing the load on the surface force plate was measured and the person were asked to do the sit to stand task if you see here if you see here the person was asked to do sit to stand task and different body measurements were recorded and these body measurements were used to understand the phenomena when the triggering of the muscle activation takes place and accordingly the 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 motors may be designed to give the support torque because person can put will not put the 100% of the torque required to this to the standing um, job or from sit to stand operation so in that case you require some support torque but when to do the support torque what level of support torque has to provide this study guided us in doing doing the things so this was the experimental setup where we had measured the the response from leg muscles cardiac response emg and all these were interfaced to understand the the behavior of the signal which was useful for uh, for designing the support system uh, 
this is just a mechanism design which can be used after uh, controlling the EMG signals. This was a pneumatic powered uh, support uh, which may be optimized based on the signals obtained from there. Now, uh, now this uh, I'll take you to, to an idea of industrial study done uh, in uh, hardware industry of the river, where the worker was doing buffing polishing task, and their assessment using the discomfort map was made and it is found that lower back was at very high if you see here lower back was quite high over here and then the workstation was modified and we had some extra attachment over here which provided or which controlled the back angle and controlling the back angle on the workplace provided a very good support in the worker so that worker can have a better output on the workplace so this was this was modified workplace and working on the modified chair this is simulation as well as practical study where discomfort was mapped this is simulation done in hcad software where mannequin was in was placed on the designed virtual workstation first it was done then the work is and then the chair was modified and and then it was used in the workplace so using different signal patterns we did this study so this was all about uh, human fatigue and fatigue analysis which I wanted to give an idea to you. Now, before closing uh, my lecture, I want to say that ergonomics is not limited to human being. It is extended to all living things. For example, uh, animals. Bullet card is a very common, common uh, way of transport. It's still in most of the villages of India. So, animal is also precious to us and we can see the the conditions one of the study which i share in this ending of the lecture that it is redesign of the blood car redesign of the uh, the harness of 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 bull so harness redesign is one of the initiative towards uh, animal ergonomics. So I'm I'm closing my chapter on fatigue assessment in the industry and giving a further idea that not only human beings, animals may require the implementation of ergonomic principles so that their life may be or their efficiency can be can be obtained. Better efficiency can be obtained. This was all from my side. If you have any question, I'm here to to answer as much as I could. Thank you very Thank much. So much, sir, Thank for you. your valuable words. Uh, party, participants, now you can ask questions if you have any doubt. Any question is welcome, uh, if you have. And I hope this lecture will help you in uh, further modifying your mechanical output or mechanical designs. So, no, no, sir. It is well uh, said, Mala. You are uh, sharing your words so wonderful. So we are glad that you are sharing your words. Thank you. Thank you also so for us and you giving us the time, your precious time. So I requested Thank all you. the participants, please kindly unmute yourself and ask question if you have any. Even if you have questions later on, you can send me an email. I will try Thanks. to respond. Okay. Thank you so Thank much, you sir. Thank you so right. much for you. Thank you. Such a wonderful session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good Thank luck. You, sir. Thank you, Pooja, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pooja. Good luck.
now our next session will start at 11:45 so i requested all the respected participant so be online or come at 11:45 for the next session thank you so much thank you thank you so much sir thank you so much सर आपने पूजा को नहीं बोला था क्या मतलब कि नहीं कहने के लिए और इसलिए इसलिए मैंने अपना वीडियो ऑन कर लिया था ताकि पता चले कि मैं बोलने वाला हूँ <laughs> अच्छा ठीक है को होस्ट उसमें क्या होता है को होस्ट में क्या होता है अरे सर गौरव सर म्यूट कर लो <laughs> <laughs>